So uh, welcome to our January webinar. Um, uh, we skipped our webinar in December. So the topic that we will be talking about this evening is the one that you chose for the December webinar. Uh, the poll is active for February, so you can go ahead and vote. And once I'm done with the webinar and before the Q&A, we will close the poll and see what the topic will be. If you have any suggestions, as always, type them in or email them to me later on, and I will include them in the poll for, for next month. Um, the goal is for you to hear about the things that you're interested in, in learning about. So that's why I like it when you propose the topics. If you have any questions already, or if you have any questions as I go through the webinar, just type them in the Q&A and I will address all of them or most of them because sometimes there's quite a lot of questions. So uh, our topic for this evening will be um, about why people don't change or about our reluctance to change. Uh, I titled it deciding to change as the first obstacle Although I think it might be better to think of this as an obstacle that comes about from time to time. So it's not just the, the first time before you seek help. It's something that happens during the process in therapy or whatever kind of change that you choose for yourself. So essentially, we will be discussing and analyzing uh, different reasons why people choose not to change even though the problem that they have, in this case, hair pulling, is quite significant. Um, these are some of the topics that we will be talking about. Uh, you know, first, that people need to realize that the problem is actually a problem, which is not as simple as it may sound. Uh, we'll talk about acceptance and what it means to accept the problem as a precondition to seeking help. We'll talk about change and acceptance and how they relate to each other, because I find that this is always a point of contention with clients where they understand uh, acceptance as just giving up, whereas acceptance is really fundamental for people to be able to change at all. And then we will talk about different reasons why people are reluctant to accept the problem and how that uh, prevents them from changing, or at least changing constructively or in a controlled way. And then we'll talk about avoidance and how avoidance can prevent you from changing and why that's a particular issue when it comes to hair pulling. And then in the end, I will give you a few tips in terms of how to proceed and untangle yourself from, from that issue. Even though I, I think if you are here, then you've probably already made some steps forward. And then once we're done with this, we will proceed with our regular Q&A. Uh, I'm going to start with a letter that I received actually quite recently, and I have the, this lady's permission to share parts of the letter, uh, except that I had to omit personal data, obviously. So here is, the, here is how the letter starts. Uh, my daughter is 17 years old, and she pulls her hair. She has been doing it on and off since she was 12, I think, although we didn't realize it was a problem until maybe a year ago when I started noticing that she's constantly touching and pulling her hair while watching TV, doing homework and other activities. I find hair all over the place. It's especially pronounced when she's stressed or angry. I can't seem to get her to understand that this is a problem that needs treatment. I'm terrified that she'll have permanent bald spots. I've seen the images online and it's frankly scary. I even showed, showed some of them to her. She seemed shaken, but it didn't change anything. Do you think she could still benefit from your program? The short answer is no. Uh, unless a person is willing to commit to therapy, I think going to therapy has no clear purpose, which is uh, in this case, for example, you know, a parent might be able to get a child to attend therapy, but just the fact that a child is going to, ther to therapy sessions or is participating in our program doesn't mean that the child will actually do anything to change, in this case, her situation. So for us to be able to, for a therapist or any kind of mental health professional to be able to help a patient, they really need to understand that, um, that they need help. In this case, uh, I sent an email that the, the parent didn't, this mother didn't really like. 
I mean, she appreciated my answer, but pointed out that it's rather difficult. Uh, and my answer basically consisted in telling her that uh, there's really very little that she can do. Because even if her daughter understands intellectually that hair pulling is a problem, that that's not a guarantee that she will be willing to deal with the problem. It's kind of like uh, if you know someone who smokes or if any of you were smokers at any period in your life, then you know that everyone who smokes knows that they can get lung cancer and chronic obstructive lung disease and that it affects you know, your entire body in, in, in negative ways, yet a lot of people just continue to do it anyway. So just understanding that something is a problem, that something has a name, isn't always enough for people to seek help. I encouraged her to talk to her daughter and to kind of try and get her to actually understand that she has a problem. And when I say actually understand, I don't mean intellectually because intellectually she does understand that. What I meant is to sort of understand through her own experience how little control she has over her behavior. As long as people have this idea that they can just stop, that's usually a sign that they're not ready for therapy, or in this case, the daughter just simply didn't want to. So this will be, I think, maybe the crux of, the, of, the, of our talk tonight. We will be talking about why is it that people seem to understand that hair pulling in an abstract sense of the word is a problem, yet when it comes to giving up hair pulling, they often seem to be extremely reluctant. So I get at least one of these emails per week and sometimes even more. So this topic, when you voted for it, I was quite happy because I think it is an important topic for people to reflect on. Even if you started the process of change, I can see a lot of benefit to thinking about sort of where your resistance to change lies and then diving in a bit deeper and understanding why that is the case. This is quite simple for me. Without acceptance, there is no change. Except that now you can ask me, what, what do you mean by acceptance? And then for me, acceptance, I don't know how other people define acceptance because this is a term that psychologists often use, people often use in all kinds of contexts. And then we tend to think we know what we're talking about, but it often turns out that when we really try to define it, we don't know. So I have a very minimalist approach to what acceptance is. For me, acceptance is just a certain clarity of seeing. So understanding what the problem is, and then understanding where that problem fits within your personality, your psychological space. How does it make up who you are? How does it affect how you see yourself? How does it help you or prevent you from going in a certain direction in life? So it's understanding the definition of the problem, its implications and consequences. It's not acquiescence. It's not just saying, oh, well, I have hair pulling, right? It's not giving up on change. It's actually the very foundation for change. It's acceptance in a sense is the true insight that you have a problem. Uh, and what's often difficult to accept is not pulling itself. Actually, in one of our support groups recently, this was a, an important topic of conversation, how pulling in itself actually feels really good. And then a lot of people shared that, uh, in all honesty, if they didn't have bald spots to cover or if other people didn't th think it was weird, they wouldn't really even try to stop pulling because it does feel good. So pulling in itself, like the action of pulling a hair out, isn't necessarily what people would consider the problem. And that's not something that's always difficult to accept. But what's difficult to accept is what that means to us, what the implications of that are for how we see ourselves. So if I have this problem, if I pull my hair, what kind of a person am I? What does this say about me? This is where the trouble with acceptance starts. And this is usually even when people start to understand that they're having a problem. Uh, very often people, as if they pull for a long time, and then if the intensity of pulling slowly increases over time, so if it's not sudden, but kind of starts slowly and then progresses a little bit, and then especially if you migrate, if, you, if your pulling sites change, then for a long time, the damage that you do to your hair 
uh, your body in general can go unnoticed. And then as it becomes more visible, what people usually do is they develop these subtle uh, mechanisms of hiding the damage, uh, covering it up in certain ways. So a problem can actually be quite severe with other people having no clue what's happening with a person, right? And, it's, and, and all this time, usually when people tell me about what they do in therapy, they will say I'm hiding it from other people. I don't want other people to know. But what that usually boils down for me, because I see humans as relational beings, other people are usually mirrors to ourselves, right? So what usually what this usually means is that a person is also hiding hair pulling from themselves. All that covering up isn't just so that other people would think this or that, it's so that a person wouldn't face that opinion because they would have to understand what is it that they're doing to themselves and what the consequences are. So uh, the trouble with acceptance and the first barrier to actually changing is that we often don't like what this says about ourselves. And even though we like to think of humans as being rational beings, and I use this with air quotes, and if I could possibly make more annoying air quotes, I would, because I think this idea that we are very rational beings is just empirically wrong and insisting that we are isn't really helpful. Uh, because if we were, then we would never talk about resistance to change, for example. But the, the, uh, I don't think we're irrational either. I think we just have a logic that isn't necessarily that mathematical if then logic. It's not conventional logic. It's not universal. It's deeply private. There's always a logic, it's just that it, it arises from our experience. And there's a pattern that, that is often observed. When we realize that the implications of something that we do make us, in our eyes, somehow a bad person, a failure, you know, weak, those are some of the, 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 the descriptions that I often hear. Um, and, and if we see ourselves that, then we're faced with enormous guilt and threat. Sometimes if, if being successful, if being strong, if being in control is something that's, you know, a core value to you, something that deeply affects who you are as a person, acknowledging that you actually have a problem that you cannot stop or resolve is incredibly difficult and incredibly threatening. And many people will just choose to ignore the problem or rationalize it in one way or another, because the alternative is to seriously shake up your fundamental sense of identity. And our psyche functions in that way that it will change only when it has no other choice, basically. So there is this window which can last, I guess, you know, for some people shorter, for some people for an extremely long periods of time, where we kind of uh, try to, try to not necessarily maybe alter our reality, but certainly obscure it so that we can continue to think of ourselves in a certain way. And if we, if you go back to the letter that I quoted, as my correspondence with this woman, uh, with this mother kind of uh, continued, uh, one of the things that she quotes her daughter as saying is, I have it under control. I can stop anytime I want to. Now, from everything I learned about her daughter, she cannot. But for her, it's at that in this period of her life, and adolescence really is a very turbulent, complicated period when we like to think, we have to think, in fact, that we're in control because it's so overwhelming and complex, all the things that are happening. So she needs to think of herself as someone who is in control, which means that she cannot look at hair pulling as a problem as a serious problem because it would make her, you know, question who she is. And in adolescence, we question hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of facts about ourselves. We have to adapt to how our bodies are changing. We have to question about, I don't know, like who we are as people, what do we want to do in life? Where is this going? You know, there's so many questions that we have to deal with. And then thinking of yourself as someone who is always in control is incredibly important and a source of stability. So for this girl specifically, saying, yes, I have a problem that needs treatment would be devastating in a way. It would really make her change 
a lot more than just just a habit again on the quotation marks. Uh, so if you've been to any of my previous webinars, you know that it's very hard for me to finish a webinar without saying the name George Kelly at least once. And he has a very interesting interpretation of the concept of hostility, which I'm, I'm very happy and excited to share with you, because I think it, it tells you a lot about why we don't change and how we manipulate, uh, how we understand the world and ourselves in order not to change. So hostility is usually in, in psychiatric practice and just in co common parlance, you don't use the term hostility in the way that Kelly does. He really gives it a special twist, one that I find absolutely fascinating. He has a text that was once available online for free in a PDF uh, about the bed of procrastes, and he uses that as an example of what he thinks of as hostility. So briefly to tell the story, it goes like this. So in Kelly's kind of telling of the story, uh, procrastes has uh, this kind of I don't know, like an ancient Greek version of an Airbnb, I guess. And so he has guests and he is proud to say that he is like the best host that he can possibly have. In fact, he's the perfect host. And then when he has a new guest, he will give them a bed to sleep on. And then when guests go to sleep, he will kind of take a peek a little bit in their room to see if everything is all right, because everything has to be absolutely as he thinks is right for him to be the perfect host, right? So he's a bit of a perfectionist there. And then sometimes he will see that people sleep on the bed, but they're much shorter than the bed. So then he would go into the room and just tie them up to the edges of the bed and stretch them out so that they can fit the bed perfectly. Because if they fit the bed perfectly and only if they fit the bed perfectly, He's a good host, and my God, he has, he is a good host. So, you know, the customer is at fault. The customer needs to be taller, right? And then sometimes he would take a peek and see that their legs would fall off the, you know, off the bed because they would be too tall. And then, you know, poor Procrustes had no choice but to kind of shorten their legs so that they could fit perfectly on the bed, because reality in this case couldn't possibly be right because he's the perfect host. And if he's the perfect host, then bed has to fit just right. And this is what we often do. Uh, and you can, you can generalize this, not just to hair pulling, but to nearly anything. And we do, we actually employ this mechanism quite frequently. And because sometimes that's the only way for us to survive. There are some parts of our identity that we simply cannot change overnight. And what, when they're brought into question, we feel like we're being deeply attacked, like our, like our very existence is, is you know, brought into question. Uh, kind of like Procrustes, he cannot, uh, he cannot understand and accept the fact that some people might not fit his bed perfectly and that it's not his fault and doesn't say anything about him as a host. He, what he does is he kind of bullies reality into being what it needs, what he needs it to be. So that's what hostility is for Kelly. When our experience tells us that our ideas about ourselves or other people or the world or anything else, when reality tells us that these ideas don't work, that the empirical evidence that we get doesn't match what we actually perceive and how we interpret our experience, Instead of changing our assumptions about ourselves or the world, what we do is we try to kind of just fudge the evidence a little bit so that we can continue to think of ourselves in a certain way. Sometimes this is really something that helps us survive, helps us bridge a very difficult period. But most of the time, this is a huge impediment to change. Uh, and not only that, in itself, it is an additional source of suffering because you have to actively basically extort evidence. You have, to, uh, you have to do everything you can to alter the input that you're getting so that you can continue to have the same self-image. And in most of the time when, when people struggle to actually take that first step or genuinely commit to changing, even if they have formally kind of started the process, it's because of this. 
it's because looking at pooling and understanding what that what the implications of it are is simply too painful and then people will say things like well i could stop if i wanted to or you know i could just pull one hair and what does it matter and there's no really there's no difference and then if they pull a lot then they'll say oh well you know it was stronger than me and then one of my pet peeves when it comes to this is when people decide that hair pulling is simply genetic because uh, so scientifically we have no evidence that it is uh, but i feel like very often when people label something as genetic what they're saying is nothing i can do about changing that oops so they kind of give up their agency because there is no drug that's going to change your genes there is no uh, psychotherapy that is going to change your genes, right? They are what they are. It's, it's like, I don't know, I have blonde hair and no amount of talking about my blonde hair is going to make it another color. So that's also, that can also in some cases be a form of hostility where people will say, oh, I really, you know, I, I, I would, if, if it was up to me, I would do something to change it, but it's just what my genes are like. I'm born this way, what can I do about it? So that can also be a form of hostility. I will give you throughout this webinar, I, I will give you some examples of messages and, and stuff that I've heard from clients so that you can see how that looks like in reality. So here is one, one example of this. Um, this is from, from a client. Uh, again, I have the permission to share this quote. Uh, These days I'm thinking it's easier to just own my pulling than to admit that I'm powerless to stop it. I can't be that weak that I can't even control my own hands, my own body. If I own it, stand behind it, I'm saying I'm in control. I can stop anytime, I just don't want to, but I can stop anytime. So look at how this person reframes their pulling. So what they're saying effectively is, it is my experience that I have no control over but because and not having control means being weak and I'm not weak I'm strong and because I'm strong that means that I actually have control and because I, my experience tells me I don't and at the same time I have to think of myself as being strong I'm just going to own the pulling and say no it's not that I can't stop it it's that actually I just choose not to so this is one way where kind of reality becomes twisted, where you're, and when I say reality, I don't even necessarily mean some sort of objective reality. I mean the reality of our experience, of this person's experience, because in their experience, they cannot stop it. But because they have to be strong and therefore in control, they have to insist that, that it's not, that it's a problem, it's just that they don't want to stop. So I can stop anytime is one way to say, I just cannot accept this problem because it makes me feel weak. Now here, uh, since I've mentioned in Kelly, I can't, I can't not apply his theory to this. Um, so a construct underlying this would be strong versus weak. And if, if your identity hinges on this, or at least if a large part of who you are or how you see yourself hinges on this construct, I have to be strong and I can never be weak then you're not going to want to give up that construct, right? Change in this sense would first require for you to either concede that you're weak or to redefine how you position yourself there, to kind of redefine the whole dichotomy and say maybe weak or strong is not the best way to look at it. Maybe discipline versus, I don't know, irresponsible or whatever, right? Another way to do it would be to limit the scope of the construct, which is to say, I can be either strong or weak, but this only refers to those things that I can not control. And if I cannot control something, then I'm neither strong nor weak. For example, you cannot say that you're weak because there's COVID out there. You know, how, how could you possibly apply that dimension to COVID because it's not something that's in your control. There's, you can't stop it. There's no being strong or weak. So for, for a person to actually be able to take uh, steps to change their pulling, they would kind of have to address this category first. 
because this is a more a core issue for them, let's say, one that kind of goes above hair pulling. I hope you can, you can see what I mean. If not, ask, ask me to, if there's a point that you want me to clarify, and I will. And sometimes people will come to therapy, and then we will talk about this, and then we'll find different ways to reframe, reframe how they see themselves. We either redefine what being strong means, I see that this topic apparently is important for you because there's a bunch of you raising your hands. Just please type in the questions and in the Q&A and, and I will answer all of them. Um, so in therapy, what we would do then is parallel to obviously working on practical aspects of pulling and understanding pulling, we would also have to work on this level for a person not to see themselves as weak or at least to kind of see themselves maybe as weak in this particular aspect, or you know, to make a change on that level so that they can actually proceed with therapy. Otherwise, they won't be able to even acknowledge the problem. And also what you can see in this little quote is how a person kind of balances their on this very edge of the reality of their experience and their fantasy about themselves. And, and how that line is so fragile and so thin and so easily crossed and easily redefined. So hopefully by now it's clear that acceptance is really necessary for change. Not to complete the change, but to initiate the process, to even understand what needs changing, right? The way I like to look at acceptance or Maybe it's a better way to say working on acceptance since it is a process, uh, one that where we go back and forth all the time. I, I like to say that acceptance is is really like a map of the terrain. So for you to know how to get to your destination, you need a map, and you, so you need to know what the space is, so what your psychology is, what your environment is, everything that kind of has to do with the problem. And then you have to know exactly where you're located on that map. And then you have to know where your destination is. So this is all the work that has to be done before one actually starts changing pulling. Because, you know, if you're going to go on a journey, then you need to know the path you need to walk. So acceptance itself is a precondition to change pulling. But at the same time, accepting pulling requires a degree of change. In the previous example that I gave you, that would be this idea of having to be strong at all costs. Here, I tried to put it in more abstract terms, just to point out to more structural issues that need to happen. So one change would have to be, I'm not my problem, or rather this problem is something that is a part of me, but not all of me. In which case a person can say, if we take that strong and weak thing, and say, well, I'm strong here, 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 and here, but this may be a place where I'm a little weaker, right? And then another way that you separate yourself from your problem is to say, um, this is an obstacle that I have to cross. You can frame it as a challenge to being stronger. Uh, for example, very often when I work with clients who are religious, their religion will allow them to actually frame the problem in a very productive way. You know, they will say this is a temptation that I need to overcome, or you know, it's it's something that's meant for me to grow spiritually or psychologically or whatever way. And then another way in which you can reframe it is that I'm okay even though I have a problem, which for all the perfectionists listening to me now might be a difficult task. But that is the kind of superordinate change that has to happen for pulling to be address addressed fully. or both of these, of course, combined. Now I'm going to say a few words about avoidance and change. And I think this is really important for BFRBs, specifically for BFRBs. For other conditions, maybe not so much, but here it's, it's, it's an important issue. So hair pulling and all other BFRBs have this very strong avoidant component. We actually had a whole webinar about avoidance and hair pulling that was, I think last year or the year before, um, one of these, it's called emotional avoidance, I think. Um, so people pull their hair, very, not everyone, but a lot of people pull their hair 
so that they would avoid processing certain difficult personal experiences. So that those could be you know, negative emotions or just bad feelings in general, difficult thoughts, disturbing memories, trauma, you name it. If any kind of discomfort, right? And and so change itself requires you to work through a lot of negative emotions. And I don't mean just those emotions that you avoid. So for example, a person could be avoiding stress by hair pulling. And then obviously therapy would have to involve working through stress. But even more than that, change of any kind always requires anxiety, for example. And sometimes depending on how deep the change is, requires guilt and threat. Because uh, guilt basically tells us that we've kind of been dislodged from our sense of self because we're changing our, you know, who we are. So we have to step outside of who we are. So to try something new, you might have to experience a little bit of guilt. And then because, and then you have to go through that guilt in the direction that you've chosen. And then anxiety is always there because change by definition means doing differently. It means doing something new. And when you're doing something new, you don't know what the outcome will be. You can choose the most logical, most evidence-based intervention, but on a personal level, you still have no clue how this will pan out for you. You know, like a, you can read a study that says that, I don't know, like a certain procedure works 95% of the time, but which puts, you know, odds overwhelmingly in your favor, but you still don't know because you don't have experience with it, whether you'll be in the 5% or in the 95%. So change always involves anxiety. And if you already have this tendency to avoid anxiety, then change itself will be incredibly difficult for you because you will want to avoid change. So you may start therapy for hair pulling, but then once you approach those moments where you have to step outside of your comfort zone and try something different or try something new, those avoiding patterns might come back again, and then you might actually avoid change itself. So it's something that I see, for example, in therapy when people come and then they, they're incredibly motivated, and then we almost clash because they want to make changes right now, like just this very second. And then when they just jump into the pool immediately and face all the horrors that they will have to go through, they then start canceling sessions, avoiding sessions, or just kind of giving vague responses or changing the topic or introducing other things uh, into sessions just so that they wouldn't have to actually go through this change. Uh, there's, I, I remember one case, but this was a few years back and it was a like a live set, live sessions, like a face-to-face -face client, not in trick stop. Um, and so the client came to therapy precisely because of hair pulling and also skin picking. And then we started working on this and very soon came to this, um, well, let's say a trauma without going into, into, into details because I never asked the client for permission to share the details. Uh, but so there was a trauma that kind of started the whole thing. And as we were approaching that, and feeling safe with people and trusting people and trusting yourself and feeling feeling safe and feeling comfortable in your own skin, the client suddenly started coming to sessions, but just kind of producing all kinds of side problems. So suddenly, I don't know, like the a, a neighbor she doesn't like becomes a problem or uh, someone in work becomes a problem or uh, this silly conversation with parents becomes the arc that in our sessions that lasts for like four weeks. Basically, the client starts bringing everything else to the table and saying, well, look, I have this problem, this problem, this problem, this problem, solve this, solve that. Basically solve everything that I find easy and simple to deal with. Let's just not touch this thing, which I find incredibly exciting. So there you have an example of how something that starts as an avoidant me mechanism of avoidance of memories of a trauma, then kind of goes one step up and becomes avoidance of actually working on the issue. And in cases like this, there really aren't any quick solutions. And in general, I guess if you've been to webinars, you know that I'm not a big fan of quick fixes or you know, life hacks and stuff like that. 
I'm trying really hard not to roll my eyes. So in, in cases like this, where, you, where avoidance is, is so pronounced, I think patience is maybe the key. Both patience on the side of the client and on the side of the therapist. Because inexperienced therapists can get really frustrated very quickly. And uh, that obviously then sends a very bad message to the client because the client then feels misunderstood and rejected. And in turn, sometimes clients start to understand that they're avoiding something and then become very frustrated with themselves, which leads to more pulling and then more disappointment and then more avoidance and then more additional frustration. So there's always a risk that both the therapist and the client will spiral in their own way and then nothing gets done. So being patient is really important. I often tell my clients that therapy is best thought of as a marathon, not a sprint. And also, I think it's important to keep in mind that change doesn't stop once therapy ends because life continues. So in that case, working on self-compassion, on self-care, on straightforward communication is extremely important. Uh, the reason why I say this is because trauma is incredibly difficult to deal with. And self-compassion is absolutely necessary. In fact, it's a necessary motivation to deal with the, the, the issue. And at the same time, once you realize that you start, if you're starting to avoid something, instead of beating yourself up uh, and adding more suffering on top of this whole mess of suffering and anxiety, the a better thing to do is to just remove at least one or two layers of suffering by just being compassionate to yourself. So that would be one thing. So being compassionate and being patient. And then another thing would be to communicate issues very clearly. I tend to be quite direct with my clients. Um, I, I hope I'm not rude, but I will ask difficult questions just point blank without a lot of, I don't like mince words and everything. Um, and I think it's important to have clear communication. If you catch yourself avoiding, or if your therapist catches you avoiding, it's their obligation to, to kind of communicate that with you uh, or it's your obligation to communicate that to yourself and to your therapist. And in that case, it's, I think it's, it's much better in terms of therapeutic progress to say, today I don't feel ready to work on my pulling, but I'm willing to work on something else. Uh, this is not always running away from the topic. We can talk about one and the same construct using different elements. So technically, for example, you can talk about um, you talk about pulling by talking about uh, self-soothing in general, because pulling has this soothing effect. So in that sense, if you talk about relaxation overall, maybe you're not, you know, you're not addressing what's very difficult for you, but you're working on the problem indirectly by addressing different elements of the same set, of the same construct. So there are always communication strategies and ways of talking and framing the issue that you can adopt. This is, a, this is another example from a client. It's hard for me to implement competing responses. So it's a part of the habit reversal training uh, because I'm always afraid of failing. If I fail, then I'll think that it will never get better and then I will pull more. So because the client is not certain about the outcome, they choose not to try even, right? And truth be told, no therapist can tell you, don't worry, you will 100% succeed because I will just go ahead and assume that whoever your therapist is, they're not psychic. And also there's really no guarantee. And there, there is actually one guarantee, which is you will fail for sure at a certain point. Because uh, if you choose, even if you choose like the best strategy in the world, you're only human and it's a new thing for you that you have to implement in your life. So you will fail sometimes. We always do that. So like if you cook a new meal for the first time, a new dish of some sort, you'll certainly fail in something. It's not going to be perfect. And even if you make something all the time, you will sometimes make it badly. And the same goes for changing. We will fail, right? And if you cannot cope with failure, then you will be reluctant to try and change something. I often see that, that uh, for example, in clients who are not quite ready to change, they will come in 
full steam ahead in the program. We will communicate a lot, exchange messages almost daily. They will send me long, complex, beautifully worded answers. And then we get to these competing responses and we, in session three, which is the first truly practical healing part of the program. And then they will just stop checking in or write once a week or say, oh, I was about to practice my competing responses, but, you know, work got busy. Or I was about to start my competing responses, but then Netflix just magically turned itself on and I had to watch and pull for seven hours. So I just had no time to practice competing responses. And then they will slowly kind of go away for even a few months sometimes and then come back and when they're ready and say, okay, now I can work. But once you catch yourself finding excuses, even if they sound extremely rational, I suggest that you treat them as excuses just in case. That tells you that there is something there to be addressed. And then when we come to this barrier, as, as it was the case with weakness versus strength in the previous example, what we do is we go one level up because then we have to address the root cause of this. In this particular case, the client is not trying out techniques that could help him because he's afraid of failing. So then what we address is fear of failure, right? And how that has to do with how client sees himself. So whenever you encounter an obstacle, just hammering on that one is not necessarily the way to go. Sometimes you have to take a step up and then look at things from a higher perspective. If I fail, what does that make me as a person? Like, what does it say about me? Am I incompetent? Am I stupid? Am I you know, weak? Whatever, right? It can be a different, different thing for different people. But then we, ad we, we address the meaning of failure. Because usually what people will, will do, they'll say, okay, so I was about to implement, I don't know, using a fidget toy, just a random example. And then they don't because they're afraid of failing. And then what they do sometimes is say, okay, well, maybe it's not a fidget toy that I should try. Maybe I'll try a worry stone. Maybe I'll try like a wristband. Maybe I'll try, I don't know, taking deep breaths. Maybe I'll try sitting on my hands looking for something that will, they will feel willing to try. But if fear of failure is what's stopping them from trying, then there is no technique. Then there is nothing you can do unless you address the fear of failure. So instead of getting blocked or frustrated with yourself, just take a step back and see which part of the equation is not working well. Is it that you've chosen the wrong technique? Is it that you've chosen too many of them? Because this happens all the time. Or is it that you're afraid of failing? And if so, then address that. See what that means, what the implications are, what the consequences are. So because hair pulling uh, provides self-soothing, it can alleviate tension, anxiety. You know, it can also divert your focus from, you know, a fear that you will fail at work or, I don't know, the fact that your house is full of people and you can't stand them or whatever else, like whatever's happening in your life, whatever private experiences you're having and they're difficult, pulling can provide a, a, a kind of a short break from that, right? So especially if your pulling tends to be in those trance-like states where the, the entire focus is on pulling. Uh, we had a webinar only on, on that topic, uh, but in those situations, for those of you that don't have that experience, Basically, your entire world in the moment reduces to pulling. So this is an extremely powerful experience because whatever is troubling you, whatever issues you're having in the world, everything disappears and there is only pulling, right? So it's incredibly efficient. That's the trouble with it. If it weren't efficient, it wouldn't be a problem. Right? So self-soothing is basically like a short acting antidote for stress or anxiety or, or any kind of restlessness or arousal in the body. Sometimes self-soothing is also an antidote to happiness because uh, even positive emotions cause stress in our bodies. So sometimes even when you're terribly excited because something good is happening, you can still experience the urge to pull. And then self-soothing can come in as a very quick fix, right? And the trouble actually starts when stress that we're experiencing 
or any kind of negative experience has to do with what we value in life, with our goals. Uh, and then cooling actually starts working in the service of our goals and values. Because when people are not willing to recognize where their limitations are, and instead focus on the goals and then think that they should be able to accomplish whatever they imagine that they should be able to accomplish. That's where self-soothing actually comes in very handy because every time you approach your breaking point, when you just cannot handle the stress anymore, a little bit of pulling can relieve the tension and kind of provide a little gratification, even a sense of accomplishment. And then you can continue on your quest towards your goal and ignoring your personal boundaries. So in certain instances, uh, pulling isn't actually something that takes you away from your values. It's something that actually helps you move closer towards them. And if you think about it very logically, very rationally, why would you give up something that's helping you be more in line with your values, even if it causes tremendous suffering? I see this very frequently with clients who are very ambitious or who are willing to um, who are willing to give up a lot for their careers, and then when or those clients who don't want to give up anything in life. So you know, like the kind of client who wants to have five kids and be a CEO and not have a nanny and do everything on their own and cook and take the kids to school and work 12 hours a day because no human being can possibly do that and they're not willing to kind of give up in any of these areas, then pulling actually allows for this impossible situation to sustain itself even longer. Right? So sometimes pulling is a way for us not to look at our boundaries and then again, not have to question ourselves and goals that we've set for ourselves. Because giving up on pulling would mean giving up on your goals. Maybe it would mean that you need someone's help. I don't know, if you have three kids, maybe it means that you can't take care of them alone and you need some help there. If, um, you know, if, if you have trouble at work, then maybe it means that some of your goals are not meant to be at all. Or maybe some are just not meant to be in the time frame that you arbitrarily set for yourself. Uh, here's here's an example, a very recent one. Uh, Vladimir, I think we've reached an impasse. This was a message I got from a client. I can't stop pulling as long as my stress level are as high as they are. So this is very clear insight. Stress is leading me to pulling because pulling is self-soothing, right? So I have to reduce my stress to ultimately reduce my pulling. I can use my worry stone or wear a hoodie, but those are just temporary fixes. Also very good insight. Any kind of replacement habit that you introduce, it's helpful, helps you gain control, helps you minimize the damage, but it is a temporary fix if the stress is the primary cause, right? And then the client goes on and says, my stress levels are simply too high, but they're also necessary. I can't stop now since I'm really close to becoming a partner in a law firm. Uh, I have maybe a few years left and I feel I have to, I feel if I give up now, I've wasted all this time and put myself through so much and for what? Only to quit. I'm weak, once again, weakness, always a different client. I'm weak if I quit my career goal and I'm even weaker if I keep pulling. Talk about a catch 22. I find that this is a very candid, very intelligent, and a very difficult insight. If I quit my goal at work, I'll just feel weak, and I'll think I've wasted all these years. And if I keep pulling, I'll think of myself as weak anyways, because I can't control something as simple as pulling, something that is, quote unquote, just a habit. And this really is an impasse where you come to a crossroad and you don't want, you can turn left or you can turn right and you just don't want to do either. I don't think there, a lot of analysis is necessary to show why, um, why this is such a difficult situation and why this would be a reason for someone to stop changing. If you look at this carefully, you can see a lot of perfectionist tendencies here, a lot of black and white thinking, and a kind of uh, 
I would say even admirable, even though destructive commitment to goals. I specifically mean this part. Um, if I've wasted all this time, so if I give up now, I've wasted all this time and, and put myself through so much and for what? This is basically saying I have tortured myself for years, so I cannot stop torturing myself now for the sake of consistency. Because not giving up is incredibly important to this client. It's about being strong, it's about being resilient. And then the client is obviously not able to question this self-image that they've built. And then they have this impossible choice to make. And I don't know, can you guess what they chose? So what to do with all this, right? If you're reading this or rather if you're present here and now and listening to me, you're probably not at the very beginning of your journey. So you probably have a degree of understanding of hair pulling. You have your own theories as to how it operates and what purpose it serves. So maybe you're not all the way there and not completely ready to commit. Maybe you struggle with resistance from time to time, but you're already making a good step. A lot of people don't even make it to where you are now, right? So think proactively. Uh, the reason why I finished this main part with uh, this client in particular is because you see something here which I think is, is a major obstacle to being proactive. That's this idea that if you've been going through something incredibly difficult, straining yourself and draining yourself for years, that somehow you have to stay faithful to this pattern of behavior. From a constructivist point of view, um, and also from a CBT point of view as well, it's just that I, by default, say constructivist, since this is how I look at the world. Um, whatever you think you are is just something that you think you are, right? right? It's how you see yourself. You have this idea that our self-image is really something that is slightly foreign to us, something alienating, alienated. Like that when we focus on our self-image, we're kind of alienating ourselves from our real selves, let's say authentic selves. You have that in, in psychoanalysis as well, when Lacan talks about the mirror stage and, and sort of how this image that is being constituted is actually, in a sense, oppressive, right? Um, so thinking proactively means not taking these ideas about yourself as being the truth of who you are, but rather seeing them as tools, because that is what they are. Um, those are just the, some ways that we've framed our behaviors because we think we'll achieve something and we will adapt to the world better. So being consistent with one and the same self-image that never changes in a world that always changes isn't exactly the most logical thing to do and isn't, isn't the healthiest thing to do. So w whatever part of yourself you're struggling to let go of so that you can actually really dive in and, and make a significant change, I would suggest that you first start making a little bit of space between you and that part of yourself. Um, if you're in the program, a good starting point would be session six and those cognitive diffusion techniques if you practice mindfulness, that is something that you can do. I mean, if you just want to buy a book about acceptance and commitment therapy, you can learn cognitive diffusion yourself. For me, for example, the way that I do this is that I always like to say that I like to nurture this kind of ironic approach to myself. And when I say ironic, I don't mean just being snarky to myself. So, or, or I don't certainly don't mean it in the Alanis Morissette kind of way. I mean it in the way in which a philosopher that I really like defines it, Richard Rorty, who, who taught, he has this amazing book that I highly recommend you to read. It's really just incredible. It's called uh, Contingency, Irony, Solidarity. And he talks about um, irony as being aware that whatever you think about the world and yourself is just the best way that you can frame things at this time. I'm simplifying Rorty now, so if there are any Philosopher list, philosophers listening to me don't attack me, but this is not a philosophy lecture. But that's the gist of his idea. Whatever language I use to describe myself, 
whether I say I'm strong or, uh, you know, whether I say that I'm resilient or that I'm ambitious or that I'm smart or whatever, uh, or that I'm completely horrible and, you know, and wretched in every way. Uh, this is just my, Rorty would say, current final vocabulary. So it's the most important thing I can say about myself at this very time. And that's how I like to approach this. So when I kind of hit a wall with my thinking sometimes, I don't really hold it against myself. I just think of it in terms of, well, these tools that I have, these words to describe myself and my experience aren't very useful to me now. It's the best I can do, but they're not very useful. And when you have this kind of mindset, then you're far less likely to do what this last plan did, which is to stubbornly insist on being consistent. Because I don't need to be consistent, I need to be happy, and I need to lead a fulfilling life. So for me, consistency isn't a value. Uh, for me, a value is to be adaptive. Right. And then if I think of myself that way, I will be more likely to question how I frame things and how I look at, at who I am. For example, this whole situation with COVID has caused very radical changes in how we do psychotherapy. Only three years ago, um, doing psychotherapy in writing wasn't really very common or, or very normal. Doing things over Zoom or Skype or whatever platform people use. Uh, wasn't wasn't the, the standard, and then I we I guess I'm not the only one. I guess a lot of therapists had to redefine the way we do our jobs because back when I had clients sitting in front of me in the same room, I could see their entire body in front of me, and that's incredibly important to me. When I work with TrickStop, because it is one of the, the main things about TrickStop is that people who created the program were very intentional about making it as anonymous as possible so that people don't have to reveal things about themselves. And often I'll work with clients and, you know, sometimes they will tell me what their preferred pronoun is or they'll tell me their age range, but often I don't know. Sometimes I don't even know what country they're from, right? So suddenly I have a lot less information. If I work with someone on Zoom, I see their profile or their head, but I don't see the rest of their body. So I can't see when they suddenly become stiff. I can't see when they become relaxed. There's a lot of information that I don't have and that I had to learn how to, how to understand and think of in different ways. Uh, so for example, I never had this situation that internet connection becomes unstable at the crucial moment in therapy because in real life, you cannot have, you cannot say, oh, I didn't hear what you just said because, you know, there's some weird sound or like you're, you're breaking up. But online, that's a legitimate form of resisting therapy, right? So I had to change the way I see myself as a therapist. And I have, I know a lot of colleagues who have had a tremendously difficult experience transitioning to online work because they have these rules like, um, I have a psychoanalyst colleague who says I cannot see someone online if I haven't seen them at least six times offline. And I think, why? I mean, maybe you have to change the way you approach working online, but this is an arbitrary rule, right? And this, I'm, I'm not giving this as, an, as, a, as a rant against therapy online because I actually like doing therapy online, but I'm saying that it required me to change a lot of my methods and it required me to adjust to this new universe that now we live in now, right? So if I wasn't thinking proactively, I would probably be stubbornly sticking to some things that simply don't work. Because there's a lot of stuff that we can do offline that you can never do online and vice versa, but I now know this because I adapted. And the same goes with, with pulling. Whatever is behind it, like whatever pattern of behavior, that is what you need to take as the best way you could frame your experience until this point in time. Uh, one thing that you can also do is to connect therapy and change with your values. Because it's our values usually that determine our actions. And I don't mean here in the way that I used it previously, where sometimes pulling helps you achieve your values or rather work towards achieving them. I mean this in the sense of like, I value my health uh, or I value, I don't know, my appearance or I value control. So 
whenever I work on pulling, I'm actually reinforcing this value. Because then you're not framing this as an issue of whether or not you're a weak person or out of control or crazy or whatever. You're framing it in terms of this, this is a test that will allow me to become a better me. Right. So what you can also do and what I recommend really most of my clients to do is to break down the process into smaller and manageable pieces. It's it's not very likely that you will be motivated to change if you start therapy and say, I have to quit picking or pulling uh, in three months. For example. First of all, this is usually arbitrarily chosen, like there is no universally agreed upon time in which you have to stop pulling. And second of all, if your pulling has been going on for a long time or if it's intense or if you had therapy before or if you tried different things on your own, giving yourself such a daunting task will immediately kind of just trigger your fear of failure or it will produce failure and then you will lose motivation in the long run. So by kind of creating unreasonable goals, you might actually reinforce resistance to change. So what I usually like to tell people is don't, you can set re eliminating pulling entirely as your ultimate goal, but week by week, this is a meaningless goal. Even day by day, it's a meaningless goal. I mean, by all means, do everything you can not to pull, but try to set a goal at something that you can achieve. So because a little bit of validation accelerates change. So say I'll do 10% less per week, or if I pull in, a in, an episode, in an episode of pulling, if I pull for, I don't know, 10 minutes, I'll pull eight minutes this week and stop myself afterwards. Just break it down into very, very small steps. Um, if stress is the issue, and then a lot of people like to try mindfulness because it's so popular now. Um, and it's also very effective, but then people say, so I'll just meditate 20 minutes twice a day, and then they obviously they fail. So start with two minutes, just sit and see how long you can sit and then do that, right? Make your own rules, but make them manageable. And give yourself time. Uh, and I, I always feel like I'm delivering bad news when I say this, but really, if, if you're looking for change that is sustainable, it's not going to be very fast. Uh, and of course, be patient with yourself because there will be failures and there will be obstacles along the way and they're there to help you grow even better and even more. So uh, that's all I have. Let me see how long it, uh, well, I could have been a little faster, apologies. Let me close the poll and then we'll go to the q and I will share the results with you. Um, and then let's see what won this month. So it seems, okay, so the topic is for, for February will be PTSD and hair pulling. This is an interesting topic. 